Hi, this is Erin Brewer, and I'm with Maria Kepler, and she is one of the founders of the Compassion Coalition. So I wanted to talk to her today and find out what her interest is in the coalition and then some of the other things that she's involved with. So Maria, I am delighted that you're here, and I'm also really happy that you're involved with the um, Compassion Coalition because I feel like you bring a perspective um, that's different from some of the other people, and it's nice to have lots of different insights into this um, into what's going on. So can you just tell me what interested you in the Compassion Coalition? Well, I was really pleased when you invited me to take part in it. Um, I work with a group called the Arlington Parent Coalition. We're in Arlington, Virginia, and we are working in, and I shouldn't say in, we are working to try to hold the public schools here accountable to taking care of parents' rights and making sure that kids are protected. And we've been um, together for about a year. We have a panel of leadership and several hundred parents um, who take part in our group. And we're struggling with what the schools are doing around sexuality and gender issues, specifically in leading kids down paths um, and cutting parents out of the process. And um, when I see, I know so many parents who are dealing with this with their kids, and when I see the role that the school is playing, it's really troubling. Um, I don't think we're looking at good outcomes um, for a lot of these kids, and it's really heartbreaking. And so um, for me, the Compassion Coalition is a fantastic group of people who all are concerned about this issue, about what's happening with children, wanting to protect children from decisions being made for them or being led into decisions that they're going to regret later. And each of the groups that's part of the coalition sort of has such a different aspect that they're working on. Maybe they're working on sports or like we are working in schools or working on counseling and therapy or working on um, legislation. And for all those groups to come together and say, yeah, we need to work together. We need to push back on this from all these different perspectives. I think that's really valuable. So you mentioned um, that schools are undermining parents in a lot of ways by promoting um, things that a lot of parents would probably feel really uncomfortable about if they knew. And I know that there are some states where parents can opt out of sex ed. Um, and so as a parent, if you're talking to a parent who says, well, I'm not really worried because they send home a form and I opt out of it, so, so my child's not exposed to any of this. Can you explain to them why this is a concern? Yeah, the traditional opt-out forms that the school offers you opts your child out of the specific family life education class which um, schools tend to do that maybe once a year, maybe twice a year. Um, in fourth and fifth grade, it's that little chat you got where they separated the girls and the boys and they talked to you about the birds and the bees. That is all that opt-out covers. It does not cover when the school counselor comes into an English class and gives a gender harassment presentation as one did in a seventh grade class here in Arlington. Um, a boy in that class knew that that was not something his parents would be comfortable with. He had the traditional opt-out, um, but it didn't cover that. Mm -hmm. He asked to be excused to go to the bathroom, and he was not allowed to leave until the presentation ended. Oh, wow. That kind of thing is happening all the time. It's being pushed into core classes, so you can't get out of it. And the way they're doing that is they're slipping it under the umbrella of anti-bullying. We need to train kids not to bully each other, which is a noble goal, mm -hmm. but so much is focused on sexuality and gender right now. I spoke to a person who was taking substitute training to be a substitute in our system and um, was told that the anti, or I'm sorry, the mandatory reporting training, which is if you suspect a child is being abused as a teacher or someone working with children, you are a mandatory reporter. You have to report that. Seven or eight out of the 11 slides in that presentation were all sexuality and gender. There wasn't anything other than that really presented. So this has become such a systematically pushed agenda. And if your child is in school, 
they are being introduced to this. Um, it's in the halls, it's in the posters, it's in, they've got um, programs, special days every month. Can you go into specifics? Because I'm hearing that a substitute teacher was trained on sexual harassment issues, which to me seems pretty innocuous. I want my kids to be able to um, be protected from sexual harassment in the schools. So can you go into some more detail about what this kind of gender agenda is? Because I think so many parents really don't know what it is or what's happening and what kind of messages their children are getting at a really young age. Right, those are important questions and important distinctions. Yeah, we absolutely want to teach kids not to harass each other for any reason. But what's being taught are things like the gender unicorn and the gender bred person. Can you explain that, that for someone who doesn't know what those are? Yeah, that was part of the substitutes training. That is being taught in kindergarten all the way up. The gender bred person or the gender unicorn are two graphics that um, they're made to be presented to children. It shows either a little genderbred guy or genderbred person or a unicorn. And it separates out what you think about your sexuality or your gender, what your body actually is, who you're attracted to. And there's one other, there's four different um, things that they call continuums. And your genitalia probably your biological genitalia. Yeah, I think that goes along with the, the biology of it. Um, so there's, yeah, who you, what you feel like inside, what you're, who you're attracted to, your genitalia. And, and those this are is being presented to kids as young as kindergarten? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in our district last year, they had a special day where they read the um, I Am Jazz book, which is a picture book, a story book geared for four-year-olds about gender and it starts out with the doctors made a mistake god made a mistake and um, at this particular school they read it to two classes of kindergartners had a transgender um, activist come in and read this wow. and told kids you may not be what you think you are you may not be what your parents said you are um, and so they're presenting this as though this is fact as though what your body says about you has no bearing on what you really are inside. And the parents aren't told that this is happening. No, that particular day when those two classes of kindergartens were, kindergartners were taught that, a letter went home less than a week before, very long verbose. It came home on a Friday. Who reads everything that comes home <laughs> on Friday? And um, three paragraphs of we have this wonderful at, um, extra activity. We've got special speakers coming in. They use the word transgender once in the middle of the third of the, middle of the second the second paragraph in the center, and it was very disingenuous. They they really hid it and slipped it in. Um, so as um as as a parent and also a former teacher, what do you think the impact is of children being told by their teachers that they can be born in the wrong body, and that even though their parents tell them they're a boy, they could actually be a girl, and that the genitalia you, you have doesn't indicate what sex you really are. That is so confusing for children. It is so confusing, it's frightening. I talked to one dad whose son was in one of those two kindergarten classes, and he told me his son came home scared and like didn't wanna talk about what happened at school and was embarrassed and didn't want to even talk about it and had a lot of fear. Um, other parents have said their children are scared. One, one child, I think it was a girl, was afraid to go back to the doctor because mm -hmm. she was afraid if the doctor made a mistake before, oh. maybe she'll go to the doctor and the doctor will say, you know what, I made a mistake. You're not actually a girl, you're a boy. And she didn't want a penis. Um, I talked to a psychiatrist who said for young boys, the fear of their penis falling off is a real fear that happens and lots of boys struggle with that. And so to be told, oh, even though you have a penis, you might not really be a boy is horribly confusing. But for me, one of the most insidious parts of this is that it undermines parents. Mm -hmm. Schools are telling children, hey, what your mom and dad taught you isn't actually right. And if they tell you 
that we're wrong, well, they're wrong. We're your friends and your parents are actually teaching you things that aren't true. And it undermines parents, it undermines families. It just puts a wedge between the school and the family. Um, and the school is telling these kids, we're your friends, we're the ones who love you. And if your parents don't agree with this, they're hateful bigots. I can't even imagine what a child would feel when they go to school and are told that their parents might not be smart enough or wise enough or loving enough to tell them what their true sex is, or that a doctor when they were born might be so stupid that he gave them the wrong sex. Like these are messages um, that really undermine both the parents' authority, but also sort of the whole perceptions of reality because part of a parent's job is to help a child understand reality. And this is really telling them that they can't trust their parents. And if they can't trust their parents, who do they go to? Yeah, they go to the school, they go to their friends, they go to the internet, they go to the GSA club. Um, I mean, if you really wanna get into the sort of philosophical roots of this, I think it's rooted right in postmodernist thought that there is no such thing as truth. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest um, teachers I ever heard talking about this, um, he said, you know, postmodern thought is so convoluted. If someone tells you there's no such thing as truth, they are asking you not to believe them because that's clearly not a true statement if there is no such thing as truth. Um, so I think a lot of it's coming out of that thought. It used to be that if you had gender dysphoria, you felt that your body did not align with who you felt like you were, that was considered a psychological struggle, a psychological issue. Mm -hmm. And the body was understood to be the truth. This is a physical thing, we can see it. You know, every cell of your body has either XX or XY chromosomes, except in the very small segment of the population who are intersex, which is just a tiny group of people. And even um, still in intersex, they're either male or female. They either have a Y chromosome or they don't. Right. So it's usually pretty clear what nature intended before something went wrong in those cases. Um, but now we're being told, no, the body doesn't matter. It's the mind. And so instead of getting therapy, getting counseling to help your mind align itself with the truth of your body, now they're saying, oh, no, no, we have to change the body to align with the mind. I've had people tell me, oh, it's much easier to change the body than it is to change the mind. Really? But you can't. Ultimately, you can't because no. it's in your DNA. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. just thinking about that image that you gave of the child going to the doctor and being afraid that the doctor might have made a mistake the first time and might tell them, oh, you're actually a boy when you're really a girl or vice versa. and that child insisting like how how do i know how do i know what i am and that's a really important question i think because there is no litmus test for this there is no um basically it is all based on feelings just as much as other sort of um mental health issues are based on feelings so someone who is depressed or someone who feels um antisocial or someone who has anorexia or other body dysmorphic orders are all based on their thinking and the only way like there isn't a test to say you actually are born in the wrong body you actually you know and so so i was just trying to figure out what do you even say to a child who is um, come home with a concern after having been told at school that it's possible that they were born in the wrong body yeah um my children are older and so i've been lucky to miss out on that. Um, but if a kindergartner or first grader comes home with this, um, I think the parents have got to be really strong and say, you know what, I'm telling you the truth. Your body is who you are. That is such an integral function of who you are. And at that point, if, you're, if your school is telling your kids that, you really need to ask yourself if that's the school that you want your kids in. Um, because it, it's such an insidious, unhealthy, damaging thing to do to a child to tell them that. Um, and I'd be curious, I know I did some investigation, I live in Utah, and I was really curious because I started hearing about um, school policy 
where teachers would hide information from the parents. So if a child decided to transition at school, teachers would actively hide that information from parents. And I was shocked to find out that some schools in Utah actually do that. Do you know anything about that? Oh yeah, that is a big issue that um, trans rights activists and people who are working on policy to support this affirmation only that you have to tell kids that um, you know if they think they're the opposite gender that they really are, they want to get that policy in there that parents cannot be told if the children don't give permission for that. Our school district last year, the Arlington Parent Coalition formed because these policies were being written and trying to be put into our school system. We fought tooth and nail. Ultimately, we did not succeed in keeping those policies out, but we did get one clause taken out and the clause was for hiding it from parents if the children didn't want the parents to know. And they did take that out. Unfortunately, the um, assistant superintendent for instruction made it clear that they were going to try to massage the language to get that back in there. And the American School Counselor Association, which is the largest association of counselors in America, it's almost all school counselors belong to this association, their transgender um, um, policy, I'm not sure policy is quite, not quite the right word, their guidance for school counselors says right in their guidance, if the child does not want their parents to know, best practices to hide it. And, and this is happening. Montgomery School District over in Maryland, right across the border from us, they now have a gender identity intake form. And it's a two page form for, I believe it's for school counselors to use with kids. And it says right on there, how supportive are your parents? And it's a one to 10 scale. And do you want your parents to know about this? So the, the, the child can insist on being called a different name than their given name. And the teachers will go ahead and do that without letting parents know. Yeah, that's been happening for some time. I know a lot of parents that that has happened to, and it's now being codified in the policy that that's what schools are to be doing. And the scary thing is that I'm starting to hear about cases where children want to transition and they go to gender clinics and their, their parents aren't supportive of it. They're um, getting charged with uh, abuse and being threatened to have their children taken away. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, there's a case in Ohio. Um, a couple lost custody of their biological child. Um, I believe the child was 17, but was still a minor. And the court awarded custody to the grandparents because the parents would not give permission for cross-sex hormones. That's playing out with the Younger case, the James Younger case in Texas as well. Um, yeah, it is an issue. And so... So this is no longer um, just about preference. And when we start talking about medically transitioning children, this is not just about a name and a, and a preference for clothing. This starts to change their bodies physically permanently. And yeah. so if a child can, can insist that they want these drugs and get them without parental permission, um, that's pretty scary. It is, it is. And we're seeing so many of these kids two, three, five, ten years down the road, really regretting what they did. Um, if you just go look up on YouTube detransitioners, you find hundreds of videos of these kids and it's heartbreaking. And they're asking, why was this allowed to happen? Why was I allowed to do this? Why did no one stop me? One of the other um, leaders in the Arlington Parent Coalition she summarized it very well. She said the gatekeepers have failed. The gatekeepers are the teachers, the doctors, the therapists, unfortunately the parents. And so many parents are being led down the wrong path and it's not their fault, a lot of, a lot of them. When this happens to your child, and I know a lot of people who this has happened to their child, they go to the school, they go to the doctor, they go to the counselor, and all they hear is you've got you've to affirm it. You've got to agree with it. You've got to use those new pronouns or they're going to commit suicide. It's this emotional manipulation. And the thing you hear over and over again, would you rather have a dead daughter or a, or a transgender son? I can't even imagine being in that position and being told that and knowing in my heart that it wasn't 
that I didn't want my child to, to be medically transitioned, to have these in, invasive um, drugs and surgeries that would harm them permanently. And yet being told that if I didn't, that I would be responsible for my child's death. And that message for the child to hear that, because these children are hearing that, that, that if they don't get what they want, they either can kill themselves to show that they really needed it, or they should threaten suicide in order to get what they want. Mm -hmm. I can't think of any other situation where, where children are encouraged to use that kind of emotional manipulation against their parents. Yeah. Yeah. And so much of this seems to be coming out of the internet, out of social media. You talk to so many of these parents and you hear the same stories. My child started spending a lot of time on social media, on Tumblr, on Reddit, on DeviantArt, and then getting involved in the GSA clubs at school. And so many of these kids have an underlying diagnosis already. Um, Lisa Littman did a study. She's at a Brown University. Um, it was attacked and then was you know, re-looked at and it was found there was nothing wrong with it. But out of 256 kids, she found over 60% of them had a prior diagnosis of something like autism, prior depression, prior trauma. So these are at-risk kids by and large, and they're being told, this is the reason why you're struggling. It's that you're in the wrong body. And if you transition, you're gonna, this is gonna fix all your problems. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't fix all their problems. But um, as a kid, you can see how attractive that would be. If you have yeah. a lot of feelings that are really uncomfortable and you're really struggling, if someone comes and says, all you have to do is take this drug, you're gonna mm -hmm. feel better. Right. And, and from what I understand, most kids do initially feel better because hormones have that effect. So even, you know, anybody who starts taking hormones initially is going to have sort of a euphoria because that's what hormones do um, when, they're, when they're used. Um, and so, so the kids sort of get that affirmation of, oh, this was the right choice. And all their friends are happy for them and they're getting all this encouragement. And then a year or two down the road, they're, they're in trouble. Yeah. Well, and the really horrific thing that's happening with schools too, is all of this affirmation that's thrown at these kids. You walk down a middle school or high school hallway, you will see the pride rainbow and trans flags everywhere. Um, I did that in my son's high school. I just went down looking every single hallway has it in there every month they're having activities to raise awareness to you know they have coming out day well if you come out on coming out day you know it's like a birthday party you get a big party this is the new trend i mean this is this is i want to say it's like the goth of the 90s but i don't think goth was ever celebrated quite as much as this is but there's so much celebration and um when you kind of bring up, up hey if you give kids all of this affirmation for changing genders and then they start thinking, hmm, maybe this was a mistake, maybe I don't want to pursue this, how are they ever going to back that up? Oh my gosh, I've been given all of this accolade, all these accolades, all these kudos, I've gotten all this social cred for doing this. That's I'm not going to come out and say it was a mistake. No way, that would be social death. Um, so that's another danger with this. And it's also um, one of the things that happened here in Utah and is happening across the country is that children are not allowed to get therapy that would help them to identify those underlying issues such as depression, such as trauma, such as autism, that are leading them to feel this kind of disconnect with themselves. And so not only are their friends um, and society sort of telling them that they'll be celebrated if they transition, but therapists are unable to actually help them identify those underlying issues and in some cases are mandated to uh, firm a child's choice to medically transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's we just happened to in Virginia too. Yeah, they've just passed that law here too. Um, and that's, that's just horrifying for children uh, and for therapists who, you know, they know you've got to look into somebody's history. You've got to ask questions about why do you feel the way you're feeling? That's just part of good therapy. 
And to not be allowed to do that is really criminalizing good therapy. It's, it's criminalizing people who are doing the right things to help others. And those poor kids, if they realize that they've made a mistake, who are they going to talk to? They've been told their parents are hate haters and bigots. Their mm -hmm. teachers gave them misinformation. Potentially their doctors did. Their friends aren't going to be there for them. These kids don't have anywhere to go. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, there are starting to be people speaking out about their experiences. And mm -hmm. so there's um, sexchangeregret.com by Walt Heyer. He's mm -hmm. someone who offers a lot of support. He went through a full medical transition, um, gender change operation. And he started that just so that he could reach out to people because he realized what happens when people um, come to terms with the fact that all that they did to try and transition didn't actually solve their problems, didn't make life any better. And, and then they become really self-harmful and suicidal. So he's got that organization for them. Do you have any advice to, to parents who might be struggling with this? Um, yeah, find a trusted resource. Find someone, something who is critical about just blanket affirmation. We have some resources on our site, arlingtonparentcoalition.org, and we've got some resources for um, if your child announces that he or she is transgender, um, some to-dos and not to-dos, um, some things that we're finding are helpful, things definitely not to do. We have a resource on there, how to find a gender critical therapist, um, because that's getting harder and harder to do. Um, go with what you know. You know your child. You know if that child has just suddenly done 180 on who they are. Believe that, trust that, and do what is best for your child, not what society is telling you to do. And that's hard because it's being made very, very hard for parents, but we are going to have to be the ones that protect our children because nobody else is right now. Yeah. I want to ask you a question sort of as a woman, how, one of the, the things that really is shocking to me is how the transgender movement is really reinforcing um, regressive stereotypes of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. And I was just wondering how you feel about that. What is your perspective as someone who sort of um, grew up watching feminism um, blossom and, and this idea that we didn't have to conform to rigid gender stereotypes. And now children who don't conform to those rigid stereotypes are often told that they're transgender. Yeah, that's a, it would be a humorous irony if it weren't so tragic is I've seen graphics where they've got woman on this side of the graphic with a Barbie doll and man on this side of the graphic with a GI Joe and then the continuum. And you just look at that, and like, aren't these the stereotypes that you're trying to reject that you have to be a Barbie doll to be a real woman? You have to be a GI Joe to be a real man? That's ridiculous. We're, as we're, a child, can you imagine being told that? And if you didn't conform to those? Yeah. <sighs> My, a good friend of mine, when her son was um, three years old and in preschool, wanted to wear the Cinderella dress at preschool every day. Um, that was a, a little freaky for the parents, but this was, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. And the teachers, there were two teachers in the classroom who said, this is totally normal. Children role play, mm -hmm. doesn't mean anything about his future sexuality, no big deal. At the time, his best friend in preschool was a girl and they just played dress up together. I don't know, I don't know how long it lasted, a few weeks or a couple of months, then it was over and it's done. That boy is now a very typically normal, heterosexual male teenager. And that was it. It was a, this is a role playing flip and that was all of it. Today, those teachers would have to tell the parents, he's telling you that he's really a girl and he needs to transition. You need to, you need to transition him right now. And that's scary as heck, scary as heck, based on those stereotypes. Oh, he wants to wear the princess dress. It really is unbelievable. Sometimes I hear myself talking about these issues and it just is so absurd and mm -hmm. so surreal 
because, um, and that goes back, I guess, to your, um, to your perspective that this is based on um, uh, that whole deconstruction idea mm -hmm. that there is no truth, that, that there, um, there's no right or wrong, that reality is based on our own feelings and thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's actually based on other people's feelings and thoughts because someone like me or you, our feelings don't matter. And maybe I was curious if you want to address that as a woman. How do you feel about the idea that you're being told that um, there can be biological boys in the dressing rooms with your daughters at school? Or that if you go into a locker room, there might be biological males there and you're not really allowed to say anything about that. It's considered transphobic. Oh, that makes me so angry. Um, I actually pulled my girls this year from public school and started homeschooling. Um, I would have liked to have pulled all three of my kids. There's reasons why we let our son stay. He's in his last couple of years. Um, but I, that was a part of the decision making process was I don't really want my daughters exposed to boys in their locker rooms. Um, my youngest daughter took swim lessons for a while and I accompanied her into the changing room every time. There was never an issue, but where we live, I know in other swim pool areas, there have been men going into the girls' changing room. And like you said, nobody can tell them to get out. Nobody can tell them not to be there. So men's feelings seem to be more important than women's feelings in this case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and there's, and I tried to discuss this with the school board, I'm like, what is the definition of transgender? When is it okay for a boy to go into the girls changing room? Because from my reading of this, any boy on any day can say, hey, I just realized I'm a girl and go in the bathroom and nobody can do anything about that. And or said, I'm oh, even, no. I'm gender fluid. So this yeah. moment I feel like a girl and I may not feel like a girl in an hour. And I was so pleased. I, we sent our organization, sent our school board a list of, I mean, there had to be 40 or 50 questions just like that. What is transgender? What are the barriers? You know, all this. One of the school board members read a bunch of those questions aloud at the meeting where this policy is being voted on. I texted her in the middle of the session and said, thank you so much for reading these. That was the end of it. Nobody answered. Are those questions online? Because I think those would be really valuable questions for, for all parents to have to take to their school oh. boards. Well, they're not, but they could be. We could put them on our website. Thank yeah, I think they me. could be really valuable. Okay, I can do that. Yeah, but they read them aloud, and then they voted and passed the policy, and that was the end of it. Nobody ever answered a single one of those questions. Um, so yeah, it is. It's very troubling. There, there are going to be problems with this. Um, what makes me so angry is when I talk about this and somebody says, no trans person has ever, you know, no trans boy is gonna attack some girl. I'm, like, I'm not even talking about trans boys. I'm talking about the pedophile mm -hmm. who suddenly has no barriers to coming into the bathroom. I can't look at somebody and know whether they're a pedophile, whether they're a rapist, whether they're a voyeur. Or whether they're actually gender dysphoric, or if they're just using this as an opportunity to be a predator. Yeah, yep. Yeah, right now I'm reading, um, Abigail Shire has a book coming out, um, Irreversible Harms, and it's about the, the gender trend that's affecting our girls. And I've, I've got an advanced copy of her book, I'm reading it, and she talks in there about interviewing some adult transgender people and I'm so, I'm, I love that she did that because she said, I've talked to these people who this is a genuine struggle for them. They've lived with this their whole lives. And she said, they just want to quietly live their lives. Most of them pass for the opposite sex and they don't make a big deal out of it. You would never recognize them in the bathroom. I'm not bothered by that at all. I, I know some people might be, I'm not bothered by that at all. I'm bothered by the chance, the opportunity that this gives people with bad intentions to take advantage of girls and women. Well, and we're seeing it now, even with sports, where it's clear that there are some people who are taking advantage of the fact that um, as a male, they can compete now against females if they just say that they're 
actually a woman. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're not behaving like women for the most part. No. Um, you just, you look at the discrepancy between even the records, you know, the record setting, um, men outperform women in almost every physical feat. That's just, I mean, for millennia, we've understood that to be a fact and you can look at the data and I pulled up all of the um, records, Olympic records for 40 different um, sports. And there were like three, four or five of them where women actually outperform men. And I was really surprised by that. So I dug deeper and all of those, the women's event was either shorter, one was hurdles, the hurdles were, were lower. It was a difference. It wasn't the exact same event. Everything where men and women compete on equal ground, men outperform women. Well, and that's why we have sex space differences. That's why we have women's bathrooms because women are more vulnerable and we recognize that. But if we're erasing the idea that, that, that um, sex is determinant of our biology, then there's a chance that we'll lose all those protections. Oh, very much so. They're, they're being lost every day. Yeah. So before we go, is there anything like, um, if you know, imagine you're talking to parents or activists or just if, if there's some message that you would like to give them, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, pay attention. Pay attention to what is going on. Find out what's in the policies at school. I know it is so hard to go to school board meetings because they're in the evenings and you've got other things. Watch it online if you have to. So much of the stuff is being slipped in under the table. That's how I got involved. Our school system was putting together a transgender student policy and not telling anybody about it except for the people who were for it. And a friend of mine was looking around on the school website for some summer school information stumbled across this and said, there's a working group meeting on this tonight. Will you go with me? So she and I went and we were horrified. The thing we walked away from with, with from that evening was everyone around the table talking about that considered parents a threat and how are we going to protect children from parents? I would say that is the thing we need to watch. That's what's happening all over the place is sever kids from their parents' authority give that authority to the schools. And that's not just happening in the sexuality and gender debates, but it's, it's happening everywhere. This is what is happening. And if we don't stop it, we are going to lose our right to protect our children. It's just shocking to me. And, and it's really heartbreaking because parents are their children's best advocate. Mm -hmm. And when parents are demonized and when children are told that their parents aren't loving, that just sets them up I mean, that's a catastrophic failure. It is, yeah. It destroys the very foundation of, of their physical and their psychological and their emotional health because the family is the bedrock of all of those things for children. Well, thank you so much for sharing your activism and your efforts. And I'm so thankful there are people like you out there who are to have their eye on this because so many of us had no idea any of this was going on. And so it's so important to have people like you who are um, able to commit time and energy to, to letting us know what's going on. Well, likewise, Erin, thank you for all that you do. I'm just so grateful for the work that you're doing, the videos that you're doing, the speaking that you're doing, and for um, you know, organizing the Compassion Coalition. Um, I, I think we have a, a strong chance to turn this around and we just um, need more and more people to find out what's happening.